Hey there. Welcome to episode two of the Masculinity Rising podcast. And really, it's just an eight-week project right now here on Instagram Live. And thank you so much for joining me. I'm re-recording this because I'm still figuring shit out. I have a little technical difficulty and had to re-record this because I totally lost sound at the beginning in the introduction. This is episode two. This is all about becoming an uncommon father, what uncommon fatherhood is. Recognizing self-limiting stories, beliefs with an absolute master of language and mentorship, and reframing what it means to be a dad. Getting rid of all those old, defeating stories that so many of us run into. And I hope that you absolutely enjoy this podcast. I apologize about the change in audio that's about to come up. And enjoy this. This is value for value. So if you find value in this, please contribute that back to me right now with emojis, with comments, with shares, because if you really enjoy this, I'm going to keep doing it. But if you don't, I'm going to stop because I'm not bringing you value. And that's what I want to do. So thank you for being here. And that's it. Oh, and one more thing. What the hell is this? What is masculinity rising? Well, my mission with this is to create a world where men can rise into their fullest potential. I strive to empower men to cultivate the strength, the power, and the presence to become powerful leaders for themselves, their families, and in their professions. Ultimately, my goal is to build a community of uncommon men who embody physical vitality, mental resilience, emotional intelligence, and are spiritually grounded. Through Masculinity Rising, I am here to create a movement that transforms the lives of men and, in doing so, the lives of women children and society as a whole. So strap in. I hope you enjoy this. Drop in the comments and share how you feel about it and have an awesome ride. So my man Jared is here. Welcome, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining me today. So excited that you're here. Uh, Jared absolutely transformed my life with just a few simple words when COVID happened. And for two to three years, I was in this fearful place afraid but desiring so much to really step out on my own and create my own business i was like i know that i have the potential to be an awesome coach for myself trainer nutrition coach meditation teacher breath worker and there was so much fear around that and i got hooked up with jared through the strong coach and i was i had so much self-doubt about what do i ask my clients to invest in me What do I ask them to pay me? What is my time worth? And Jared said something that absolutely shifted my stories, my frames, my mindset. And what he said was that you can't put a price on a human life because you are of infinite value. And I felt that here and totally shifted my stories and gave me the courage and groundedness to really ask for that value and offer unreasonable value to my clients. So Jared, thank, thank you, you for putting yourself so out much, there. my man. And, uh, uh, being open to a yeah. shift as well. I think there's many coaches out there, and many leaders out there that need it done a certain way. And uh, so when you recognize that you can shift and you want to shift, uh, it allows just for, for really infinite possibilities. So you took the first step it was awesome to have you there you sir uh are (laughs) i call you an expert mentor based on my experience an uncommon mentor and you really delight in and helping guide people to do things that they had thought were impossible but the question is you know what is that what does that mean what does that look like and what do you do? I experience you as a master of stories through shifting that story for me. But I'm curious, hmm. what does that mean? I think mastering your story is mastering your story. And uh, this was introduced to me a long time ago at uh, working at Lululemon. Um, you know, they sell yoga pants, um, but it's a personal development company at the heart of it. And so each... Uh, each person, each educator that goes through uh, their onboarding program uh, gets a reframe of excuses. I think that's what you would call it, not in the corporate world. And they just call them stories. 
Um, so it was, it was like, what are the story that you're telling us uh, about showing up late to work or uh, about why folding these things was, uh, you know, too difficult or t- t- time consuming. Uh, and so that was my first introduction to it. <clears throat> and it really just reframed um, the, uh, I would say the, like the, the roughness of an excuse uh, of like, maybe it was like a judgment towards a person that just allowed me to say like, oh, this is the story that they're going to be telling me right now. And I got to experience as if they were just reading me a fairy tale of what was happening in life. Like I knew what happened. Um, I understood. Um, but the way that they were saying it, uh, I didn't really know how much power was inside of that uh, until much later on in my, uh, which, which turned into a coaching career. Um, with going from management to then or really just like people management, right? To, uh, through different types of coaching and consulting. When you start to hear the story, uh, as a coach, you can then find different things that are soft. Uh, you can find different things that are very um, rigid. And if you can address those um, and call those words forward, we can get a deeper meaning of what's behind the story or where that's coming from. Uh, And then with a few quick edits, uh, you can rewrite this story into something that is empowering to the person um, or conveys a much clearer message. Um, As a health and fitness coach, if someone came in, they're like, oh, my my shoulder, my shoulder hurts. It's like, well, I need to hear more, more of that story, right? What does it actually feel like and if they were to say things like oh my shoulder just feels like crap it's like well, i don't actually know what if we break that down i don't know what crap feels like i imagine yeah. that it feels different than what your shoulder actually feels so is it pinching is it poking is it a burning sensation uh, and so when we got people to explain their um their story or their injury a little bit further it allowed me as a coach to to help them further um explore their their fitness and further explore their injury so that we could make appropriate modifications. And what was true in fitness um, became true in in, in business as well, or just even person-to-person communication. If you could explain that story and expand on it, uh, we could go deeper into the meaning behind it and really formulate what is it that you're trying to communicate or declare? What do you want out of your life? So it was a little little deeper into owning your story or where the story comes from or actually what we mean about telling the story yeah it, it really <clears throat> talked about how it, it it really applied for you taking that from lululemon which is really a, like a development <laughs> system into uh fitness and then taking that forward into other things in life and one thing that i think is so important is that we're all telling ourselves stories. And I think men especially have so many inner stories, but because we don't uh, communicate as readily with each other and openly, uh, there's the word vulnerability around that, but I don't, I don't like the word vulnerability because it, it etymologically comes from Mm. opening yourself to harm. And I feel, I, I feel my story about that is that I'm not opening myself to harm. I'm just sharing what I'm experiencing on the inside. Um, But that applies to more than men, it applies to women, it applies to kids. We all have stories that we tell ourselves that uh, George Carlin, oh man, I can't think of the phrase, I'll have to look it up, but George Carlin (laughs) had a whole skit on this Mm -hmm. and talking about soft talk. And it's really our our way to avoid responsibility and our ways to like just bullshit ourselves. And we're addicted to it because we like to stay small. But we don't want to be small because we have so much that we want to accomplish on the inside. And one thing that you brought up was soft and rigid story, soft and rigid language. I'm curious, outside of like shoulder, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to have like a soft story that you're telling yourself, soft language, and then also to have like a rigid story or mindset yeah. or language uh, as well? A, a s- soft language could be uh, things like should, um, uh, sometimes, maybe, one day, possibly, probably, just, 
They're words that we use to soften the meaning of what we're trying to say or create distance from what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and that distance is, is generally safety or it's protecting someone else, someone else's feelings. Oh, I don't want to come off too forward. Um, it also might mean I don't want to actually declare what it is that I want. Uh, and so we put out this someday I'm going to do this because it's something that we do want. Um, but we're not confident enough to take a stance for it right now or declare it right now or choose it uh, in the moment. Uh, some of the rigid uh, language uh, that I put in here is more like absolutes. It's always never. Um, there are these extreme words that we use to box ourselves in or to paint this picture of like, it's this way and it's always going to be this way. Um, when really those don't exist um, or always and nevers. And so if we can pinpoint as a coach, if it's this like hard cap of this always happens to me. And we were just to shave that down to this sometimes happened to me. Now what are we working with? Well, when is it working or when is it not working for you? Right. And now we, as like, as a coach, we can start to pull this thing apart. We can start to expand on this a little bit more. Uh, and so it's like, this person is uh, showing, always showing up late to work right? or my, my kids are always throwing their food on the ground. Are they always throwing food on the ground or do they throw their food on the ground at snack time or at dinner time? Right? Is there oftentimes that there's times that there's those instances are happening more often than not. And so we just dive into to that story a little bit further and see either what's frustrating or what are some of the constraints around it or what's going into that uh, uh, that moment in time rather than just discarding it or labeling it with a uh, an ultimatum or an absolute. So really should kind of sort of i should get up this morning and go work out i should meditate today i should look, take a deeper look at my finances uh whatever it might be and also so on the other end the that super rigid mm -hmm. is the word that we use but like binary language of like this always happens i uh never get out of a ticket when an officer pulls me over uh, I always get a red light. Uh, things along those lines that, that create mm -hmm. a, a particular path that we go down because we're wiring our brain with every single thing that we say. How do you see these this language limiting people? You know, how does it lock people in? Where's this path of uh, shooting, <laughs> shooting your yourself. pants? Yeah. Shooting yourself. Where, where does shooting yourself take you and where does that rigidity take you, Where do you the should doesn't you take you anywhere the <laughs> the should allows you to talk about it as the opportunity passes you by i shouldn't be doing this because in that moment you have a chance to choose that or not and in that moment you chose to shit on it and the next thing will come right uh, there's never been a case where i've worked with someone that they weren't dealing with a handful of things at one time, like a handful of things all at once. There's always something that's coming back into their fold, whether it's a family thing or a career thing um, or a personal thing. And to think that that's going to change that in three months, there's going to be less on your plate. You know, in six months from now, I won't have this thing. You, you might be right in the sense that, that there is going to, that the current situation or the current problem you're dealing with will will be solved for, but there will be something else that comes up if you are not choosing to place something there. And I think that there's a limiting uh, a limiting belief or just a, maybe not a limiting belief, but people don't even know it's possible that if you call your shots, you call in your challenges or you put your own challenges forward, those are more likely to be the challenges that you face. And so you, you, have an opportunity to choose your challenges rather than just wait for the odd ones to come into your awareness. Uh, and so if you are faced with a, 
uh, an opportunity that you are shooting on, you can ask yourself the question is, is this a challenge that you want to take on? And is it a challenge that you want to take on right now? Or is it a challenge you want to take on in the future? And if it's a challenge you want to take on in the future, then you can declare that, but be specific with it. And you can start putting parameters and create a discipline around it, knowing that in one month, I'll be starting this, but be specific with it. If you say, oh, I'll do it next month, next month doesn't exist on the calendar. Right? April does, May does, June does. And so you can be specific with the dates that you're going to be on there. Mm -hmm. And it just creates a little bit more structure uh, for you to get into a rhythm. Even Monday, like there's, which Monday? Next Monday and Monday after that, whatever Monday you're going for, just be specific with it. And then it gives you an opportunity to move forward. Uh, it's not, I, also, I should be doing this. It's, I will do this. And so you can look at the shoulds as an opportunity to decide um, or choose what it is that you want to do right then or at another point in time. We just talk about shoulds. Is there anything else? I mean, I think I might have might missed it. Yeah. I, I feel like that is that answered my question. And uh, so really, it sounds like should just lock people into where they are right now. Like instead of taking action and creating the change that you want. Uh, I just talked to the guy yesterday who was like, I'd really like to start running so I can I can uh, have the cardiovascular fitness to run around with my three year old and six year old. And uh, instead of just I'd really like to start running, I should run. It's saying I'm going to run this next Monday instead of just like on Monday or well, what Monday. So getting much more direct. And I have it. I consulted the book of knowledge. George Carlin said that soft talk mm. takes the life out of life. It, it takes everything out of your life because it, it just, it paralyzes you. You just sit still. And then he said that Americans have trouble facing the truth. And that, that's what our soft talk is doing is it's, it's, it's really protecting us from the truth, keeping us, safe. You said fear. You know, fear is one of the big reasons why we, we go in that. We fear of stepping out, being hurt ourselves, or saying something that's going to hurt somebody else. And so they invent a soft language to protect themselves from it, to protect themselves from the truth. You bring up fear or a challenge that people are going to face. And they know going into something that, like, for example, if you wanted to get started on a running, uh, a running program, we, we want the outcome. Like, we obviously, like, I want to hang out with my kids more. I want to be able to 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 keep up with them as as they grow up. They're only going to get more energy. And if you were to ask some logical question, is like, when if when you start running today, are you going to have more energy, or is it going and be a period of time of adaptation, of starting to run a little bit. Maybe you're going a little further. Maybe you're going a little bit faster. Maybe you're doing it in the woods versus on a track or on the street. And then we start to see how big this mountain is that we got to climb. <laughs> and it happens in an instant that we go, wow, there's a lot of work to be done here. Uh, and we fear that first step even though the first day might be the easiest day ever in training. Um, and so rather than allow this thing to, to build out, it, we can keep our eye on the prize of, I want to spend more time with my kids or have more energy with my kids. And then what is the, the simplest step that we can do to continue that action? Because we know it's going to take quite some time before we actually see that, that end result there. Um, and so would you rather see that now or do you want to see that in six months from now? Because if you want to see it six months from now, we got to start now. Like at any point in time, you, you, the, your best opportun opportunity to see the results in the nearest future is to start today. Because uh, we don't necessarily know when that result's going to pay off. Uh, but if we wait three more weeks, we don't necessarily know what life is going to throw at us. But if we start today, we're going to have a lot more information to work with moving forward. What's, what's the quote? It's best data best time to plant a tree was yesterday the second best time was today something like that maybe it was 20 years ago 20 years ago yeah. best time to plant a tree who knows somebody look it up drop it in the chat for me um <laughs> so <clears throat> we've got soft talk we didn't get into the rigid talk quite as much 
but I don't even know that we really have to. It seems like this language that we use, this soft language, I should, could, I really like to, and the, uh, this always happens, I never catch a break. These things lock us into a mindset. If anybody is listening, definitely check out the book called Power of Ted, The Empowerment Dynamic. And in that book, it's a story. Stories are so powerful. We're talking about stories right here about an individual realizing that he was operating from a victim orientation, which is like things are happening to me. And when we're in that victim orientation, it tends to be very paralyzing. We tend to get stuck and have trouble taking action. And that could be like, you could notice that you're doing that through, oh, I'm going to start eating better on Monday, like, like what Jared said. Uh, rather than setting a direct date, you're protecting yourself from taking action by saying, I'm going to do it Monday, but one Monday. I'm going to do it someday, but we're never really taking that, that step out into the wild, across the threshold, into adventure. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. I think you can get, <laughs> uh, we can get really caught up in the language and the story work as well. And I think it's really jarring too for, we spoke at the very beginning about being open to this. Uh, and so in a professional setting, whether it's you pay me for, for, for mentorship or uh, we are in a program of health and fitness um, or we both signed up for a course in, in language, really easy to talk about this stuff and get lost in it and uh, it's a really fun technique to 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 nerd out about it's super powerful tool tool to use uh it's also the easiest way to get in an argument um, with someone that's not interested in this so the idea of uh coaching without permission um may need to be addressed here uh, when it comes to a, a significant other uh an employee a co-worker uh if you just straight up call them out on that story um, or you start to adjust some of the the language that they're using you can invite them into a conversation but i found that in uh, personal de development uh if you're in it great um but most of the time people are caught in the wake of someone else going through personal development it's super jarring on uh, the relationship um, that they currently have or the relationships that they're trying to cultivate because there's so much learning and expectation for other people to learn uh, around them that uh, it's really important for you to recognize this for yourself first. Um, I remember going to uh, Landmark Education 16 years ago now, and I think it was within an hour or two, it was like, you're gonna, like the, the announcer, the, the MC was, saying you're gonna think this is something that your sister should be your sister should be here or your parents should go to but you're here for you so be here for the don't recommend this to anyone else um, until you experience this and you do the work um, and i find myself uh, reciting that when i read books uh, or go through courses and i'm like oh i should recommend this book to someone it's like you are trying like absorb the information for you first. Do the work, uh, digest it, consume it, um, do it. Uh, and then if you still feel called to, to share this with, uh, with a certain person, um, do so afterwards, but first do it for yourself. So if that's language or the story and you know this is coming up, is this is your chance to then seek out someone that can help you with that or know that you are limiting yourself with it, not, I think my wife needs to come in and talk to this or, uh, you know, my husband needs to talk to you about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife definitely needs to, to come in here and learn how to do this. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. At, I'm direct. I That's exactly it. what I want. <laughs> yeah. I get, I get you. I get you. Yeah. How's yeah. that working out? Um, mm -hmm. right. So, uh, I think that was a, that was a big learning lesson too, of just like my personal development, um, really will, will cause more disruption um, than, than I would say success 
uh, unless I upgrade my communication first and to be able to bring people into what it is that I'm working on and what I'm doing um, and how I plan on serving other people. Uh, I thought just if I got better, everyone else, everyone else will get better too, uh, but that's not necessarily not the case. Um, so yeah, if you're going to go into this, you got to go into this work doing it for yourself, not for, for other people. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so important for people to go into this work, to start mastering their stories, to start noticing, oh, I'm soft talking right now, or I'm really rigid in this mindset and to start unwinding that stuff? I don't know if I've met a person Many people are just like, just let it happen, you know, like whatever happens, happens. Um, most people are driving towards something or they do want something. But oftentimes that is hidden away. So there's an internal drive for people to control something or have power over something. And because it's buried in there, it can be misleading. Um, it, it doesn't have as much strength as it could or as much control as it could uh, on our attention. If we were to dive a little bit further into like, what is it that you want to have control over? And just using that language to, um, to be a little more direct. Do you want to have more control over your schedule? Do you want to have more control over your family? Do you want to have more control over your career? Just to shorten the gap. We then get to uncover some of the reasons why there's a drive there. What is it specifically that you are looking to attain or to accomplish or to experience? If it's hidden away, no one else can help us with it. If it's hidden away, we will get confused by different shiny objects. Um, uh, we'll overconsume information because we don't necessarily know if it's it's good enough or if it's the right information. And so if you're looking to get, get more control in your life or your experience by bringing it to the surface and bringing out the story around it and extracting the why, it gives us a chance to share this with other people and get support. Um, I think that's the first and foremost. The more that you share your vision, the more likely it is to come true. I think the biggest hack in parenting is like, don't tell people what you wish for when you blow out your candles. Well, how the fuck is it supposed to come true if you don't tell people what it is that you really want? Um, it's a it's a silent it's a silent wish, um, but if you tell people this is what you're looking for, um, people will conspire with you um, in that. Um, you might also already be achieving that. And you might be crushing yourself trying to accomplish something that you've done already tenfold uh, and your family, uh, your coworkers or whomever that's around you has never had a chance to, to reflect that back that you're making an, an amazing example or you've, you've taken on so much and you're doing such a great job. You don't necessarily know if that's true, but you'll still have this fire that's like, I'm not performing to my highest. I could be a better dad. I could be a better partner. I could be a better employee. I could be a better business, better, better business owner. But until we vocalize what it is that we're looking for, no one's ever going to be able to share that back with us. I really hope that they do. And it's very um, rare that people just go out and just share compliments of, hey, you're doing a great job. Um, and even even with that example, uh, normally it's not that specific. But if people know what you're going after, know what you're looking for, they can share a specific example of when that happened. You can also start creating specific examples for you to chase or to go after or, or achieve. Uh, and so if you're, the thing that you want to control most is the time in your schedule. Where do you want to spend more of your time? Oh, I want to spend more time at home. Cool. How much time do you already spend at home? Right? How much time do you spend at work? And if we can start to just start, we ask a little more questions and we also start to externalize the problem. And when we externalize this and we start to express this, whether it's uh, verbally or it's, uh, it's written, 
right? It's out there now, it's tangible. Then we can start moving stuff around and become so much more attainable once we've expressed it. And so if you're looking to have more control over anything, it's just getting out there. What is it, the experience that you want to have? And then we can start making small incremental steps in order for you to accomplish that. Um, it's, I don't want to belittle anything here, but I think the background of being a fitness coach, that almost everything can be turned into reps and sets. You can, it can be diluted down to, you know, time under tension or how many days a week do you show up for it? Um, and when you can look at life like that, or your schedule or a relationship like that, it almost gamifies it and it makes it much more fun to deal with and um, much more attainable because it's something, you know, you can actively work on. Um, yeah. And so when people say, oh, I'm working on it, I really want to dive in like, what do you actually mean about that? Um, but if working on your schedule is something that you're working on and it's, I have a weekly meeting with my schedule. Um, I talked to my significant other about X, Y, and Z, or I've talked to my boss about working from home more, or uh, I have date nights with my kids or whatever it might look like. Um, great. You know, now you can really say that you're doing the work with that. Yeah. What are the reps and sets that you're putting in to get there? So really, I, I imagine the story that's flying through my head right now with this is that beginning to get a hold on your stories, how much you should yourself, how much you should your pants, and uh, how rigid you are in your, your mindsets helps you go from driving like this <laughs> to my hands are up in the air if you're listening, to putting your hands on the wheel. All of a sudden, you are your hands are on the driver wheel. Now you can steer your life wherever you want to go, whether that's any any part of our, our five life areas, our health, our relationships, our profession, our finances, our spirituality, then you have to ask the question, well, where do I desire to go? What is it that I actually desire to experience? What am I trying to get control of? And, and what is the, the payoff of me getting to that destination? It's like we're following our GPS without a coordinates plugged in. We're expecting it to take us somewhere, but instead we're just like, why isn't this thing working? Because now we put our hands on the wheel, but we haven't said, oh, this is where I want to go. And then finally, if you're driving across the country, unless you can produce gasoline or electricity from your fingertips, you're going to have to stop and, and, and interact with someone or something and say, like, oh, hey, this is where I want to go. You have this thing that I think could help and fill up your gas tank or in real life communicating like, hey, here's where I want to go to other people in any of those five life areas. And then putting in the reps, putting in the sets. You want your relationship to be better? Schedule a, a intimacy date with your partner. It doesn't have to be physical. You're just going to talk to your partner and be like, here's all the shit that's going on in my life. Here's my story. Here's how I feel about the relationship, my story about it. Not this is what it is, because that's a defining story, but like, here's the story I'm telling myself. Here's what I'm experiencing on the inside. Keeping your sets and reps in. How do you envision? So we've talked about the, the cost of these stories, uh, ways that you can start <sighs> taking a little bit more responsibility, let's say that. How do you imagine an individual can start to bring these stories into the spotlight, into their awareness? What kind of practices do you see that could be really impactful for this? Imagination is being clouded with what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those stories flying in there. This might, this, this is true for me. I don't know if it's true for, for the listeners, but uh, I don't like to be pigeonholed. Um, you can't really tell through this recording or even the video here, um, but I'm 6'7", um, 200 plus pounds. I'm, I would say above average human in size. <laughs> and uh, I was in the CrossFit space for a very long time. It's, I'm still, still am. And anytime I did like a, a thruster or I did a, 
like a, a full a full snatch or clean and jerk it was just this like the shock and awe people was like that barbell's traveling so far like oh like other tall guys would come up like i use my tallness as an excuse to not be able to do some of these things and anytime i thought that i was at a disadvantage i wanted to rewrite that story i didn't know i was rewriting that story but i wanted to prove people wrong in the other direction uh, i wanted to show that i could do that no matter what these limitations were going to be and so i constantly tried to prove people wrong there and then the same thing went true for gymnastics it's like i shouldn't be able to do like you know handstand push-ups and muscle-ups and things of that nature that were like high skilled in the, in the crossfit world uh, became one of the best in the gym for it right so i should be being smoked by these little dudes uh, but i'm able to hold my own my reps take longer uh for sure just because of the range of motion but uh i wasn't gonna let this uh let these limitations actually become limitations i wanted to have fun uh, i wanted to have fun with it and prove people um, that I could do it no matter what my size was. Um, and the same thing, I like to coach people on the other other side of that. Um, people like to say like, oh, I'm good at rowing because I'm because I'm tall. Uh, and uh, which is it's a benefit for sure. Um, but I've also trained uh, a lot of short people to row really fast as well. And so I, I normally don't see the the limitation as like the big like I see that just as like the biggest opportunity to to shift. And uh, I really take that into the coaching, uh, the coaching realm outside of that. Oftentimes people will come to me with a business problem and they'll say, well, I don't do this. I don't offer this thing um, or I don't want to do it this way. And they're telling me what they don't want as if it's a bad thing. And it's like, you could turn that into a benefit to your business. It's like, you probably don't want to drive to the gym you know, five days a week and spend an hour warming up and doing these things. And so I help you by getting right to this chase. So your workouts are only 30 minutes. You don't have to go anywhere. You can do this from home, right? And so you can shift the thing that people don't want and reword it and remap it into the thing that would actually benefit them. That's what they are looking for. So from a personal standpoint, I always saw these uh, negative stories if you are limiting stories to be an opportunity for me to prove people wrong or to go after a new challenge um, and then in the business world so it was an opportunity for people to make more money or to uh, see this thing that's been keeping them stuck in the same place actually be something that propels them propels them forward i think we should talk about some shitty situations right now that's what i want to talk about i think we should i think we should so uh, it really sounds like uh, by beginning to notice your stories, you noticed stories in the CrossFit space, and you were like, I want to rewrite this story. Then you can literally rewrite them. And one thing that you have done in the past that really uh, got me so excited was running a journal club. Like make journaling cool again. And Jordan Peterson says that there's no difference between thinking and journaling. But there, I see that, that there is a difference in that you're making it tangible. You're making it visible now. And like you said, with noticing the stories around CrossFit or stories around uh, schedules, business, stories around uh, relationships with your significant others, people at work, whatever, if you start to write that down, you can bring that into your awareness. And then it's written down and you can tangibly begin to change those stories too. And that's a really uncommon thing. <laughs> that is totally uh, disrupting the status quo because the status quo is this victim orientation, this I should, I'd really like to, or this never happens, this always happens uh, to me. And really, that's, a, that's a, a totally different path in life. And one of the things that you said when we were chatting before this is that you didn't buy into the path well traveled in your life. And you had extreme changes uh, in your life early on. And it really sounds like, I imagine, that that contributed to your, your desire to, to see stories, to change stories. But I'm curious if you would share a little bit mm. with us 
about that? Yeah, so uh, my dad uh, was, I guess he's still in the Air Force. Um, and as a child, we moved every year and a half, uh, roughly. Um, there were, I remember when we lived in the same place for like two and a half years or three years, and it was like, whoa, this is wild. Um, but th that story, and we should, it, that experience, right? Uh, we're, killing, we're killing the, the story word right now. But that, that experience growing up <laughs> was, was very rocky. It, it was a new, uh, a new group of students. It was a new school system. It was a new neighborhood. Uh, it was a new bedroom. Uh, it was a new dynamic um, between my, my parents, depending on, on where we were. And so everything, right? Uh, absolutely not. Everything shifted when we moved um, every year and a half. And so for the longest time, I hated it. That was what I told everyone. It was like, oh, we got to do this and we have to do this. Um, I'd say the, the silver lining was we, my sister and I would shift when we got to pick who, like, who got to pick the room first um, when we were picking out the, the rooms as kids. Um, because it happened so often <laughs> we could do that. And what I recognize as, as an adult is because it's still, there's still like deep seated, like anger around that. Uh, but what came to life as an adult was that I became very adaptable. Any new experience that I put myself into or a new city or new environment, I felt very comfortable in my own ability to navigate uh, new roads, uh, navigate new social structures, um, navigate new cultures as well. Uh, and so I really felt I became this like clay. Uh, I could mold myself to anyone and everyone um, when I went to a new place. I allowed that to happen for a very long time. Uh, it, again, in, in reflection of this, when I was moving to my last, um, uh, the last time that I moved in high school, um, we moved into this really small town. Uh, I graduated 26 people, a town of 420. Uh, Lone Jack, Missouri, shout out, mules. And my dad gave me the speech of like, you can become anyone that you want. No one knows who you you are right now. They know. No one knows where you came from. You can really be anyone that you want. And I don't know why it clicked then, um, but I started to make shifts immediately of choosing the people that I wanted to hang out with, choosing the teachers that I wanted to engage with, asking the questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, and so I got to the point where I was, um, I, I was able to like throw myself into this community and become a part of it, a big part of it immediately, um, as opposed just to be a person that's trying to fit in. Um, and so it came to me later in life with this mantra of, uh, I sit with confidence at new tables. And what I get from that is the ability to ask questions, be curious, and also be willing to share my from my experience and my ideas as well and you know i really take that as uh you know, if we want to remap what vulnerability is i believe that to be true of like the willingness to ask questions and also to share your truth or share your experiences uh and so i really got to to take that into life and quickly realize that Anytime I was into a, a group setting or a team setting, um, that I would rise to the level of captain or coach, uh, and really any anywhere. <laughs> uh, and so, to me, that just remapping this, like, oh, I'll, I'll I'll shift to whatever like they need me to be, um, really allowed me to now step into this, like, I'm going to choose the role that I play in this, and. I'm going to be the one to take a stand for the, the changes that need to be made or the energy that needs to be brought. Um, I'm going to be a resource to the people that are around me um, and harness these abilities. Uh, and so that's a little bit of the, like the upbringing of like how I got to this point of like, just, like nothing need to be normal. Uh, we could always throw this new experience in there and create change. Um, I think to, the, 
the root of where we were getting at was I don't believe that things need to stay the same. Uh, there's no traditional model that I that I followed growing up. Uh, and so when it comes to doing something annually or people are always going to be like this, doesn't register as true in my life. I think everyone has the ability to change. And I think your experience has um, many different perspectives that you could take on it. Uh, and so I don't believe that you're ever stuck in one place. You might be stuck with one, one viewpoint, um, but that's a simple conversation just to, to shift it. Um, that's a change of scenery. That's a change of conversation. That's a, a change of a journal prompt. Um, there's many things we do just to shift that view and possibility just blossoms um, from there. So this idea of being stuck in one place just never really registered to me i didn't i never bought in uh, never bought into that and so when i run into people that feel a certain way um i find myself compelled to to help them at least see that they have more than one option yeah like with that like you said before it's either a really good way to help people <laughs> or a really good way to get into yeah. an argument <laughs> and either way it's all good uh, it's uh, you know, as we go through this work, you, like you you touched on earlier, as we go through this inner work of mastering our own stories, it's important to master them within ourselves before we start pushing outward with it. And it's said in in spiritual communities that as you evolve up the chakra levels, or if you want to think about it like Maslow's hierarchy of needs from scarcity and upwards towards self realization, that when you're in relationship with somebody, it becomes really, 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 really challenging to maintain that connection once you evolve more than one to two levels above them. Uh, and in this example, because of, of the stories, but I want to backtrack a little bit something that you said when your father had that, that conversation with you that like, hey, dude, you can be anything you want to be. And that, how that was a big shift for you. And it's so important, one, that kids, especially boys, have a father figure like that. And two, to have that moment, to have that moment where your father makes it explicit that he sees the wildness, the potential, the dangerousness, but also the, the capability that's inside of you. And when he did that, you were able to see it within yourself and take permission to go out and be the captain of your own life and any team that you were on. And that brings me to fatherhood because you absolutely, Jared and I met right before uh, I knew that my wife and I were pregnant with our first child. And uh, I told him in a group mentorship call, like, hey, my wife and I, I'm not telling anyone else because it's so early, but my wife and I just figured out that we were pregnant. Jared was so excited for me. And uh, he and I chatted a little bit offline about it. And I was like, hey, man, I'm, I'm really scared because there's all these stories about, like, uh, I'm not going to be necessary within the relationship anymore. That, like, it's going to be mom and baby and dad's on the back burner. But dad doesn't have a role and that, like, our relationship my wife and I is, is going to fall apart and dad's not important until the kids get older. And you, sir, totally, totally shifted my view, especially when it comes to, we were talking about shooting your pants, but having other things in pants of the baby there, uh, of taking responsibility as a father and creating a strong relationship. So I'm curious, what are your stories about fatherhood? Yeah, everyone tries to scare you. Absolutely acknowledge. Most people, yeah. most people try to scare you around it. <laughs> and it was Society. something that I recognized immediately when, uh, when we started to tell people that we were having a baby and going to different doctor's appointments. And the women were sharing their own birthing stories with, with, uh, um, with the mother of my children and they were horrible. And it was just like, please stop like just 
throwing your traumas out here right now. Like, again, not asking for it. It was just this happened and then this happened and this happened. And it's like, okay, I'm trying to keep a calm, you know, solid person here, like going through this. And, uh, and I really, I really didn't like that. Uh, and it, it, everyone just kept asking me, am I ready? You know, or like, oh, you're going to deal with this and you're going to deal with that. And like I, I, I kind of like peeked at this earlier was that when someone tells me that it's going to be hard, I immediately think it's going to be easy. I just throw the pendulum to the other side, like just huck it. And it's like, this is going to be easier. And they kept uh, this, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but it was even at the newborn stage, it was like, oh, just wait till they're two. And it's like, I can't wait till they're two, you know? Oh, just wait till they're three. Like, bring it on. And they're just like, they just get more terrible with age. And it's like, I just kept telling myself every single time someone said that, like, this only gets better. Your kid is only going to be able to communicate with you more. Right? You're only going to be able to build a better relationship from here. Like you have more and more and more opportunities to, to build this thing. Um, and so that's like, that's what I want to keep, keep like, that's, those are the glasses that I wanted to put on. And I really like looking at things through like lenses, like physical lenses. And we talked about like the difference between thoughts and writing it down. When you write it down, you then have this thing that you can take with you. Always. Uh, it's a roadmap back to a feeling or a thought that you, that you had. If, you can't do that with just a thought. You can't recall a thought. So to to get back, back to these right to to these things that I, I wanted to call forward the things that were going to be difficult and some of the like I wanted to create a better balance in the relationship as well. Um, you brought up that you were afraid that you weren't going to be as useful or necessary in the relationship, or the relationship's gonna suffer because of this. How are you gonna re- how are you gonna create a bond between you and your your child? And I don't know how it came to me, but I recognize that um, the mother is going to be feeding the child most of the time. And I'm not gonna have that experience of that one-to-one connection. And so there was already going to be this lopsidedness to their relationship and that's where they get to bond. And it's going to be so awesome. And I don't really get to experience that besides from time to time with a bottle and recognize that they shit their pants just as much, if not more than feeding. And so if I were to own that time with my son, this diaper changing moment and make this a, a, a thing that I jumped into with excitement, enthusiasm, um, then I would get to create a special bond with my son. Not only are like we getting, get, getting in there and being of service to them when they're in pain or discomfort, we get to then create a fresh experience for them. We get to put them back into a place of calm, get to play back to a place of comfort, we actually see them at like their happiest moment. And then we can deliver them back to, to mom for uh, a feeding or whatever else that we're going, to, or going into play or whatever that might look like. And so I really saw this as an opportunity for me to balance the scales of connection with my kid. And what are you telling? It's like, oh, poop smells, or you're afraid to get peed on. It's like, you wipe your own ass every day. <laughs> Right, like you're around pee every day. Anyways, <laughs> it's 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 actually better that it's someone else, like it's someone else's. Um, and to me, it's like it's a small sacrifice for uh, for that deep level connection that you can have with them. Uh, and so my my advice to the fathers out there is own diaper changes, own them, like love them more than anyone else. Like, not even let people other people change it. You know, oh no no no, this is my time with them. Because the joy, the happy, the laughter that comes after a, a fresh diaper change, you don't want to miss that. And it's a massive opportunity for you to create a connection and a bond with your child. Yeah, yeah you, I took that wholeheartedly. 
sincerely. I ran with it. And I would, <laughs> Jen and I used to like fight for who was going to get out of bed in the middle of the night to go change his diaper and to put him, put him back to bed. And I think a lot of dudes struggle with that. And if you take the initiative to do that, to create that relationship and like, yeah, well, mom gets to feed him all the time. I get to change diapers. I get to do that. And that's my role. That's how I serve here. And I get to take care of her while she takes care of him or her. That's if you have a daughter. Uh, you have a very hands-on relationship with them, with that, with that kid. And one of the things that Warren Farrell wrote about in The Boy Crisis is we all know that when women become pregnant, their brain structure changes. Their, their mommy brain comes online, that nurturing part of their brain. But we traditionally think that men don't have that same thing, but they do. You have a daddy brain in there that can, if we're using sets and reps, every set and rep that you get in of changing the diaper, of soothing the kid's sleep in the middle of the night instead of letting mom, who's already freaking exhausted, do it. Every set and rep that you put in grows your daddy brain. It's the same area in the mom's brain that grows, but it hypertrophies just like your biceps when you do a ton of bicep curls. And then all of a sudden, you become a more naturally nurturing father, which kids require. You experience more serotonin. Ah, oh, this feels good. More oxytocin. Oxytocin. I always struggle with that one. Always. I noticed. Uh, <laughs> oxytocin for enhanced bonding. Love. And all of a sudden, you become an absolutely uncommon dude, an uncommon father, rather than just leaving it to mom. And then, like we talked about with shooting and not taking action, then creating that story by your inaction that dad isn't needed and that this is going to affect the relationship between me and my wife. Hmm. And this probably just falls under the category of like uncommon parenting. I, I, I try to look for examples when I'm going into a new thing or a new challenge uh, of people that are either doing it better than me or I perceive to be doing better than me. And um, when I was looking around for uh, father figures, I just saw this like, this like be a man type, type of, of, of conversation happening. Uh, and so it was, uh, or the words just weren't there. Because again, it's like, I don't know if it just falls under stoicism or whatnot. It's like talking low, talking slow, not saying too much. Um, I don't know if they're just afraid to share, spill the beans, or maybe they just didn't, they're, they're afraid of the mistakes they made. They could have done better, whatever it might have been. But I wanted to, I wanted to be able to provide for my children longer than when I was like with them. And I'm in a, a unique situation with my, um, uh, with my, my ex. Uh, and so we do some long distance co-parenting. I, before that started, before that, um, before the distance was there, uh, I was reading a book, The Untethered Soul. And to, to spoil alerts for, for anyone that wants to, to read it. <laughs> Spoilers um, about in one of the, the later chapters, uh, they talk about death, and there is something about that, that chapter that really like struck a nerve with me in what I was going to leave behind if I wasn't going to be there for my children. If for some, for some reason I, I wouldn't be able to bear traumatic accident or I guess distance, what would the kids remember about me? Oh, dad always said this, or dad always made me feel this way. Is there something that I could also uh, give to my former to have that empower her? If, again, if I wasn't around to, to be there, she could rely on your dad would have asked you to do this. You know, your dad would have told, reminded you of this thing. And so, you know, we talk, we've been talking about the power of words. Uh, I wanted to create this as simple as possible because I was talking to a, 
uh, a six-year-old and a, and a three-year-old. Uh, and so I came up with uh, five different words that I wanted them to, to repeat to themselves over and over and know that this is really all I care about. You know, figure out wh whatever these words mean to you and how you develop these words. Fantastic. But I wanted my kids to remember that that's, those were the important things. It wasn't grades. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a, a championships or anything like that. It was for them to embrace their own style. It was for them to, to embrace their own creativity, their own athleticism, their own intelligence. And if I were to tell them, if I were to ask them, even right now, if I were to call them up and tell them, like, hey, what are the five things? They would be able to recite them out to you. Not only was it just these mantras, because I think that's also just like staring to the mirror and saying good thoughts, good things. But it gave me a chance to acknowledge them in moments where they were participating in those words. So I could say like, wow, that was really creative. Man, you're using your intelligence. I'm, man, like, I really like the style that you're pulling off right now. It allowed me to anchor those words into uh, praise. And kids love that. They love being part of jokes and inside stories and all of that stuff. And so I was able to create that through these, like, these basic words or mantras and use that to promote uh, promote more of those um, those attributes in their in their life, and um, I think it's a really simple way of being able to coach or being able to parent um, with less words and a lot more power. Too, uh, you don't have to explain yourself too much if you can just go like, "Oh yeah, you know what we always talk about? That's what I'm talking about right there," and just show them in, in a real world example. Mm -hmm. Went on a pretty long tangent there, Robert. Uh, I, Appreciate you allowing me to uh, to share. It was perfect. It's probably one of my favorite things. Perfect. I think it's called a shaggy dog story, and it brings us back. To, well, it'll bring us back, but it brings me to one really important question. And this is not it, but we're at one thirty. Yeah, cool. It's taking okay. another 10, 15 minutes. Or you got a jet, dude. We're in good stuff. Uh, I think everyone that's listening is probably like, well, "What were the five words?" I know I am. What are the, what are the uh, five confidence. words, man? I'm Thumbs up. Confident, creative, intelligent, athletic, and you have S T Y L E style. And and anytime I get a chance to tell them um, what's going on, uh, I like to bring those up uh, and just affirm that that's what that's really what I care about. Because to me, those are all. Uh, they all have to do with expression. And those are my favorite people to be around. Those tend to be the happiest people that I know, the most successful people that I know, the most artistic people that I know are the people that are expressing themselves. And to me, those five words allow you to express your truth, your experience, your uh, inner world. Uh, and that's really all I want is for my kids to express themselves fully bottom line and uh yeah uh to, to, to me uh, i like to expand on this a little bit more but i think we weigh our emotions too much of good and bad and things that we need to hide or shy away from and i think when you do that you bottle them up and you create pressure and they, they tend to pop or they get mismanaged and it's just it's much more difficult to live your life if you are bottling up any one motion or thought and if you are open to and invited to share those emotions and share those thoughts and experiences um, you get to move through them with greater ease so hard things don't hurt as much and good things don't cloud you so much. Um, they don't distract you as much. And I think it really comes down to like a much more even keeled person or the ability to go through a range of emotions and still come back to your, you know, e your equilibrium. Like what is your natural state? And, uh, uh, and so again, I want my kids to feel as expressive as possible because 
from my vantage point, the people that bottle up one area of their life or don't express themselves, that's what turns into the that's what turns into the limiting beliefs and the, the negative stories that, that keep us stuck in our ways later on in life. That was, they, that we then have to get yeah. our journal out and start. I'm just trying to help with start you know reading. less work on the back end, uh, <laughs> being open to mm -hmm. as well experiences earlier on. <laughs> so, yeah, so you've really created a like a family virtue, vir, vir meaning man, in, in the etymologically, or uh, the. I forgot the rest of it, but yeah, it comes from the root meaning man. So virtue is something that a man would do. And two, you have these five, five family virtues that create then a, like a family story. Like this is how we show up in the world. And then, and Jordan Peterson says this all the time, if you want something to do, someone to do something more, you want to empower them, recognize it, call them out. I, I saw you do this really kind thing. And uh, I just want you to know that it was really cool. Yeah. It was really awesome. And then you leave it. And every time that's your set, that's your rep to helping to, you can do that with yourself, but helping to coach your kids to become courageous, yeah. Yeah. stylish, expressive, just totally awesome, uncommon yeah. people. I feel like there's even more there. Uh, one thing that connect, you know, connected us is breath work. And as a child they experience pain and tears more than they probably ever will uh into maybe some larger events later on in life but how often do your kids cry you know they <laughs> all the time all the time all the time he was just wailing because he had to go down for a nap i don't you blame know? him we just had time change this week but no one really <laughs> at least in my world no one taught me like how to catch my breath and what you know like what, what's the benefit of catching your breath as soon as something happens we just go into panic and clench mode and like we get into the feeling so deeply and there's nothing wrong with experiencing that but experiencing that is also somewhat of a choice and i say that lightly but we can allow the pain to to fester and to build we can acknowledge it, bring our breathing, bring control back into our body, and then allow that to calm our right, like calm our system down. And then we can start having a conversation about it or acknowledge the problems even quicker than we were if we just allowed the crying to continue or the whatever the the, the instant to continue. And so we can if we can teach our kids at an earlier time to catch their breath or become one with their breath again, be aware of their breath, it allows you as a parent to connect on a completely different level when they're in a point of panic or something else comes up. It's like, okay, really? And we're going to start breathing in. We're going to breathe out. Like, and we, like we help them get through things by teaching them how to use their own physical body to do these things first. Once they've calmed themselves down, you can then start asking them questions about, does this hurt? Does it feel less than what it did? You know, where is this happening? And they'll be able to tell you very quickly what's like, what's going on or if they're okay or they need more attention. And then you can let them on and like hug them and then you can send them on their way. Uh, and so I did that early, early age. Uh, one of the first practices, I'll share a quick story, but <laughs> one of the, one of, uh, <laughs> an early basketball practice that one of my, uh, that my kids were at, uh, it ball comes like heaving in from the three point line and uh, just totally just smashed my youngest one in the face of the basketball. Like I, many of us have been there. It just feels like your face exploded. Yeah. And so like, I'm up, you know, yeah. I, you know, I immediately see him get whacked and I, I'm sprinting over there. And, uh, and so I, I, I come up there, I place my, my hand on his back and I'm like, okay, how are you doing? And he, he's like, he's like, I'm trying to breathe. And I like, my heart exploded. It's like, how does this guy know? He he's four and a half at that time, five. 
And he's recognizing that, like, he just needs to catch his breath real quick. And then it was, you know, how it's like, my face feels hot, you know, uh, it feels like it's bleeding. And it's like, okay, it's not bleeding. Keep breathing. Does it feel better now? Yeah. Does it still hurt? Kind of. Okay, keep breathing. You know, how does it feel now? It feels a lot better. Okay. What do you want to do? I want to go play. And so this thing that could have been, you know, take him off the court, shove things up his nose, you know, panic could ensue from everywhere was resolved in 30, 45 seconds. And he was back doing exactly what he wanted to be doing, you know, no fear or nothing. And, um, and I use that example even for my own shit is like, if you're, if you're getting into some stuff, be in it. Like, don't run away from it, breathe through it, and then acknowledge it and start to declare what it is that you want to do um, and give yourself that space. Um, don't succumb to the panic and, uh, and, and run from it or try to hide from it. You really want to get through, through it. I, uh, my son's two years, two months old. And already a men's coach. <laughs> already a men's coach. Yeah. If you guys have seen my stories, he's, he's a men's coach for sure. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't, go check him out. He, uh, when he loses it, he, he gets frustrated, man. I'll just ask him like, Hey man, do you want to help? And he'll be like, no. And I'm like, cool. You're allowed to cry. Go for it. And like, let it rip. And sometimes he says, yes. And I remember having this moment when I was, I kind of went, I, I went into a little, like, how do I, I teach him how to breathe? He's too mode. And I was like, like, oh, he blew out his candles. Or at least he tried to blow out his candle. So he was crying, wailing, tears running, face red. It's getting dark out. All the lights are off. And I'm like, ah, his two-year-old candle is in the cabinet. Let me walk with this dude. We're gonna go get your candle, and I just got the candle out, and I was like, "Hey, buddy, you remember how to do this?" He's like, "Yeah," and I was like, "Okay, watch me." And then he was like, "And I was like, yes, dude, yes. Do you need to do it again?" He's like, "Yeah." And so now, whenever he's upset, I just ask him like, "Hey, man, do you need your candle?" And sometimes he's like, "Yeah," and other times he's like, "No," and I'm like, "Cool, yeah, I respect that. You want to cry? It's good." And then, and we moved it to. Not a candle, but just pretending like you have a candle. You just, do you need to breathe? I just do this. And sometimes it's like, like no. Other times it's like, like, yeah. So that breath, man. And you can coach it from an early age like that. And then have that moment on the court where your son's like, I just need to breathe. And, and this hurts. And now I feel okay and I'm ready to go. Robert, first of all. I got one more question for you, man. Huge. That's a great that's a great cue and a great like uh, way to meet him where he's at, right? And a practice that you can do, and a practice that really anyone can understand too. Of like, can you blow out this candle? You know, <laughs> do we need to blow out this candle? I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to tell that to Sarah later. Today, candle, you know? right? <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's so good. And watch it. It it might not work, or maybe it will. It'll be absolutely amazing. Never know. <laughs> um, in our last couple minutes here, uh, they're now how old are your boys? Uh, nine and twelve. The nine and twelve. You also have a new little one on the way that's going to arrive, and you're, mm -hmm. I imagine, in a much different place now than you were then. Uh, how are you going to manage and approach fatherhood differently now than how you did well, at the beginning? If I were to stick with my same pattern which I probably will. Everyone is telling me <laughs> a little girl is completely different <laughs> and it's the most terrible loving relationship that you're going to have. <laughs> and so for me, I've just been reworking that of what type of relationship um, do I want to cultivate what I'm going to be open to. And, and so for me, I'm going to be as open as I possibly can to how she develops. I don't know what it's like to raise a, 
a girl into a woman. But I have the strong confidence that my partner does just through her own modeling on how to express herself as a woman, uh, how to really like express her truth and really just like allow her to be who she becomes. I imagine that there's going to be a, a roller coaster of emotions that happen much different at uh, you know some puberty ranges um, than it is with my my oldest right now. Um, but equally, rather than being fearful of that, um, really being open to uh, whatever it comes to just being straightforward with either my experience or getting her the support or help that she that she needs. And I'm open to being slapped in the face. So <laughs> literally yeah. uh, so that's that's a that's a big piece of, to me is just you know providing safety and uh, providing space for her to be as expressive and creative as she wants to be. Yeah, I think that's that's a core belief in in raising human being, you know, gender neutral. Yeah, just be, be yourself as big as you'd like to be. And there are you no, know, there's no rules. They're, <laughs> they're all made up. <laughs> Break everything if you'd like to, and um, I'll help you do it along the way. <laughs> yes. Yes, those rules are the stories, and you get to write them. I love, love it, man. Thanks for the thoughtful questions. Thank you. That's all I got. This for is you. great. I love the uh, I love the format of this, and for the people that are are uh, listening or, or watching this as well. Uh, Robert and I started this off with with breath work and and connecting, uh, and just dropping in. And there's such you know, we talked about helping other people breathe. Um, but there's such a benefit of breathing with with other people and breathing th through transitions um, before you get into um, any type of environment that's new of down regulating, sinking with your breath, um, and allowing yourself to be open to conversation and be aware of your surroundings. So thank you for facilitating that before uh, before this and for anyone that's listening in you need help connecting with others or yourself like reach out to robert and reach out to jared man <laughs> so uh that's it guys jared where can we find more of you and what you're yeah doing my uh the best place work? to reach me through is instagram i'm a huge fan of using this as a communication tool uh, and so i'm captain j davis um on uh, on the grams and uh i work for a company called The Strong Coach, uh, where we help um, business owners in health and fitness really scale their business uh, to the next level from, from where they are. Uh, and so if you're in the health and fitness space, ask, ask away. I'm an open book with that. And if there's any personal relationship or parenting um, roadblocks that you're running into, I'm happy to help you. Uh, yeah. Awesome, man. All right. I'll put that in the in the notes so you can just click away and find Jared. And that's really it. Are going long. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah. Masculinity is rising. Time to rise. Become uncommon. Become an uncommon father. Uh, that's it, guys. Have an absolutely amazing day. I love you, Robert. Jared, I love Cheers. you. Cheers. I'll chat with you soon. Peace.